I have a, quite a few questions from the registration and um, also we'll be providing some additional information. What I think I might do is just start with the presentation questions and then go through um, other procedures that you need to look at. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with um, reconciling. And I did get a question on how to handle petty cash and reconciling petty cash. And what you're going to do with that is if in your chart of accounts, if you have a petty cash account, you want to treat that like a regular bank account. And what you can do is double click on the actual account in your chart of accounts and go through and actually put all your transactions through the petty cash register. So in my petty cash box, if I have, um, you know, five slips for office supplies and stamps and lunch maybe, I can just go here and put in office max for my payee. I'm just going to click add office max as a vendor. My payment of $15.25. The account is going to be office supplies, and then I could put in a memo if I'd like. And that's the easiest way to handle petty, petty cash. Um, and what you can do is you can reconcile it. So say you always keep $500 in your petty cash account. What you're going to want to do is when you write a check for petty cash, you're going to write a check, pay to the order of cash, going to quick add these as I'm going along and say it it's going to take me $250 to replenish my petty cash. In the account, I'm going to put my petty cash to update it for the $250, save and close. And then if I go back to my petty cash register, there's my deposit. And then I'm going to list all of my um, different expenses. Um, if you go out online and Google petty cash worksheet, um, you'll get a an actual little spreadsheet that you can fill in for petty cash for you to NPL. So that's one way to do petty cash. Um, I had another question about grouping customers into specific groups. And you can definitely group your customers to be able to run reports based on that. So if I go into my customer list, I'm just going to bring up a customer. In my additional information, I can type my customers. And this can be anything you want it to be. So if I add a new customer type, and I'm just going to say test customer. Click OK. Now I can type my customers. So any other customer that I want in that grouping, I can just go in and change it to test customer site, test customer. And when I run reports, if I want to report on specific customers, maybe, let's see, maybe a sales report, sales by customer detail. What I can do is under customize reports, I can filter it by type. Now, let's see, type. Let's type right here and use my test customer. And then if I had any data under my test customers, it would show up in this report. But you're just going to customize and filter by that customer type. Let's see. And those are some just kind of questions that I got in that are, let's see here, hang on one second. Uh, 
Okay, sorry, I was just checking something. Um, but also in QuickBooks, if you go into, let's see, they still have this option. They used to have a year-end guide, which they still have under the help section. And here's one way of finding things that you should be doing at your end. So tasks to prepare for filing taxes. And you can check it, check mark all these different items. So reconcile all bank and credit card accounts. You click on this, it'll give you the help articles on what you're doing. So again, that's just under the help menu and that's a year end guide. So it'll um, kind of help walk you through some of the things you need to do. And if you've got payroll, things you need to do for payroll. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through, um, I had done a year-end procedures webinar in the past. I'm going to kind of go through some of those specifics. So closing of the books. You can close your QuickBooks um, and set a closing date. And you don't want to do this until you've actually shipped your information to your accountant. So once you give your accountant the information to prepare your tax return, I would say go into company and set a closing date. That way when you're setting your closing date, which is right here, what QuickBooks is going to do is it's going to warn you um, if you have if you're trying to enter something prior to that closing date. So let's just say I'm going to enter a closing date right now of the 31st of December, 2022. And you can set a password or not set a password. What happens when you set a password is QuickBooks will not allow other users, except for the administrator, to bypass um, entering something. So if the admin user decides, oh, I need to do this transaction back prior to 1231, the admin can enter the password um, and then make that change. What I recommend is once you've given your information to your accountant, then set your password when you get the journal entries back from your accountant, take the password out, take the closing date out, enter your journal entries, and then re-enter your closing date and set your password. Because what I've seen far often than not is I get the information from a client and then things get changed between the time I, we send them their journal entries back and so this will stop that from happening. And it's real easy to reset the closing date or take you the closing date out even. You just highlight it and hit delete. And then once you're done with your journal entries, go back and put your closing date back in. And right now I'm just going to leave the closing date in. I'm going to leave the passwords blank. And I'll show you what the system will do if I try to enter something prior to that. So now I set my closing date for 1231. I'm just going to try writing a check at 1215. Go save and new. And QuickBooks is going to say it'll let you do that, but it's not a good idea. The transaction is in a closed period. So as the admin, it's going to allow me to do it with the password, but because I didn't put a password in, it's still going to allow me to do it. So that's why I would suggest putting a password in as the admin. Um, and then once you have shipped off your information to your accountant, make sure you do not enter anything in the prior year, because what's going to happen is that's going to throw off your retained earnings balance, and then it's going to make more work for your accountant next year. 
Um, one thing I'm going to just touch upon because I didn't get any questions regarding inventory, but I'm just going to let you know that QuickBooks does have a report, an inventory report that is a physical inventory worksheet. So if you do track inventory in QuickBooks, you can do a physical inventory worksheet. It's just in your reports and inventory. And what it'll do, it'll show you your item, the description, if there's a preferred vendor, and the quantity on hand. And if you're gonna go out and actually take a physical inventory or have one of your employees take a physical inventory, what I would suggest doing is getting rid of the quantity on hand and maybe the preferred vendor. And to do that, if you put your cursor on the column to the right of the header, drag the cursor over to the left of that header, you can get rid of the column. Otherwise, what you can also do under Customize Report, if I want to get rid of quantity on hand, I can just uncheck that and click OK. And now your employees can go out and take a physical count of your inventory with this physical inventory worksheet. And if there are changes that need to be made in your vendors, inventory activities, you can adjust quantity or value on hand. The important part of adjusting your quantity and value on hand is making sure your adjustment account you have in there. If you don't put an adjustment account in, what QuickBooks is going to do is it's going to throw it into a plug account. And we never want to see anything in a, in a plug account. So I'm going to choose my cost of goods sold to make my inventory adjustments. I can find and select my inventory items. And then I can choose to adjust on quantity, value, or quantity and total value. So maybe one of my kitchen cabinets got broken. So I'm going to say I only have a quantity of five to sell. Because based on my average costing, QuickBooks is going to make an inventory adjustment of $1,500 for that item. If I have 450 cabinet pulls, QuickBooks is going to make another adjustment. It's going to tell you your information to the right, or to the left, I mean. Your quantity on hand is now $450. The average cost per item is $2.56. And this is going to be my value of my inventory. And I'm going to get rid of my closing date, because otherwise it's going to keep coming up. So I'm going to go into my closing date, take it out. It's as easy as that to change the closing date when you get your journal entries back. Another good inventory report to run, if you do track inventory, is the inventory valuation summary. And it'll tell you how many inventory items you have on hand. Um, I am using the accountant's version of QuickBooks, so I have a unit of measure turned on. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to tell you the value, the sales price, retail value. So this is a nice um, report to run if you do have inventory, because you want to make sure you don't have any negative inventory items. And again, if you do have neg negative inventory items, um, you want to adjust your quantities. The next thing you want to do is look at your accounts receivable. In your accounts receivable aging summary, again, you want to just look at it to make sure that um, all of your aging looks correct, that you don't have um, any negative values. And if you do take down payments, you might have negative values. But maybe you have old outstanding receivables that need to be written off. And what you can do is, from this report, you can either you know, decide, OK, I'm going to write those off, or maybe I have a payment plan with that vendor. Um, just take a look at it and make sure that everything looks correct on your AR aging. 
if you need to write something off, the easiest way to do it if you do not charge sales tax is to go into your customers, receive payments. I'm just going to go into multiple windows here. And let's say I am going to write off um, this sunroom, 565.95. So I'm going to go into that customer and that job, put in my amount as zero. You're going to leave it as zero because you actually didn't receive any cash. The date you're going to write it off, you're going to highlight either the number or the date. Don't put a check mark in because it's going to give you a warning if you do. It's going to want to put in a payment amount. You didn't receive cash. So make sure that payment amount is zero. Click on the gray line. Go into discounts and credits on the top of the menu bar. And then what you can do is do a discount of the amount that you're going to write off and choose a bad debt account. And if you don't have a bad debt account set up, you can set that up with an expense account. And if you're tracking classes in QuickBooks, you can put in your class. But what that will do is it will get them off your accounts receiving aging report and put that amount into bad debt expense. If you do charge sales tax to your customers, you want to make sure that you're recouping that sales tax. So what you're going to want to do in that case is to do a refund or credit. So if I'm going to do, see, let's find another account to write off. Um, let's say Brian Cook in this kitchen. I'm going to do a credit memo, and it's either for bad debt or maybe he returns something. So I could have a bad debt item also set up. And if it's just going to be a bad debt because he's not paying you, under your item list, make this a little bigger so you can see it. I can set up an other charge for bad debt, bad debt or write-off amount, tax code, non-taxable or taxable, because you can change it on the screen. The account is going to be your bad debt expense. So let's say I'm going to use that bad debt expense. Going to say it's associated with an expense account. I'm going to say OK. And let's say I'm going to write off the full amount. And let's say the amount initially was charged sales tax. So I'm going to make it a sales tax item, make sure I date it in the current period. And I'm just going to say maybe $3,500 right now because my open balance is $39.79. So it's going to do a credit to my sales tax also. So that way you can recoup that sales tax you've already paid. Or if it's not a bad debt, maybe he's returning items. If he's returning your inventory items, what you could do is use your cabinet pulls at, say, $15 a piece, and he returned three of them. That would be how you would recoup your sales tax there. So if you do charge sales tax to your customers, you need to make sure you go through a credit memo to write that off versus the enter payment. Um, you also want to look at your accounts payable. I'm going to look at my accounts payable aging. 
and make sure everything looks right here. Maybe I had an issue with patent hardware supplies and they sent me defective goods and I actually don't owe this amount. Well, in that case, what you can do is a bill credit. So under enter bills, you just want to change that bill to a credit and enter your vendor name and the items that you returned. And then what that will do is it'll zero out any outstanding payables. Or maybe you have an issue with um, the vendor. Or maybe you're paying that vendor off in an installment payment. And that's okay too. What you might want to do in that case is enter maybe a note. So let's say I have a payment plan worked out with Dale Lighting. I can just put in a note, manage my notes, add a new note. I can place a t date stamp on it saying called vendor will make payments of $100 a month. So you can put in notes for vendors, for customers, for employees, and that's a really nice um, thing that you can keep track of and follow up on if you need to. So one thing I like to do at the end of the year is look at my financial reports. If I look at my balance sheet for the end of the year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to double check the balance sheet with all of my other reports that tie into my balance sheet. So when I look at my checking account, I'm going to want to make sure it's reconciled for my accountant. So I'm going to wait until the first week of January when I get my bank statement and I'm going to go in and do my bank reconciliation, make sure it's all reconciled. In this case, it's not last time I've reconciled. We're going to go through and reconcile it through December 31st. And I'm just going to fudge some numbers here so we can make it look right when we look at our reports. So I am going to mark all. I'm just going to unmark a couple things. And I'm going to change my reconciled balance. So it matches. Okay, so now I've got a zero difference so I can reconcile. And I don't suggest doing this. <laughs> I suggest doing it properly when you're reconciling your banking account. Reconcile now. And QuickBooks is going to print a reconciliation report. I always print a detailed report because that's normally what we'll ask for. And I'm just going to display this. So when I display my reconciliation, I've got my cleared balance, which should match the bank statement. And then I've got unclear transactions, deposits, checks. Then I have my register balance as of 1231 of 22. And my register balance is 46,219.10. When I look at my balance sheet, that is my balance to my checking account, 46 to 1910. So I know I'm okay with my bank rec. Same with your savings account, things like that. So you're gonna to wanna to reconcile your savings. You can reconcile your petty cash. If I look at my accounts receivable aging report again, as of 1231, 
look at my balance sheet, 92, 441, 98. So I know my reconciliation is good. Or I'm sorry, my accounts receivable balance is good. Again, if you've got inventory, you can run that inventory valuation report. And that should match also. 24, 454. Oh, and it doesn't. So in this, oh, did I have my date right? Nope, I have my date wrong. And with your inventory valuation summary, you can hide zero quantity on hand items to make your report a little bit cleaner. So now I've got 22,655. Oh, that's my retail value. My asset value is 29,252. You want to make sure you're looking at the right column. 29,252. Balance sheet, 29,252. If your inventory doesn't match, again, what you can do is the inventory adjustment to match your inventory counts and values to what they should be. Then I will go down and normally what I'll do is print off these reports for my accountant, your accounts receivable aging, um, that bank reconciliation. If you forgot to print it out, you can always go back and print the last report under report banking previous reconciliation. And it'll give you the previous reconciliation. I always change it to transactions cleared plus any changes made to those transactions since the reconciliation, only because every now and then the PDF file will make your QuickBooks crash. So this is the one I'll always run. Click display. And here's that report again, which gives me my cash balance. So print these out for your accountant. They'll appreciate it. Same with the inventory valuation. Or if you don't want to print it out, print it to a PDF that you can put on a flash drive or email to your accountant. If you've got fixed asset additions, what I'll do is double click on your fixed assets. And let's look at our fixed assets for the year. Okay, so I bought a couple computers and a server. So I'll make my columns a little bit bigger in the memo just by dragging the right-hand side with those three little dots so my accountant can see what I bought. It's always a good idea in the memo section to put what you purchased, give a nice detailed description for your accountant. So when we update your fixed asset report, we can see what you purchased. So kind of what I'm doing is going through the balance sheet and documenting what I have. My accounts payable, again, if I run my AP aging report, that should match as a 1231, 26,636, my balance sheet, 26,636. You also want to reconcile your credit cards. And to reconcile your credit cards, it's just like reconciling your bank account. You go to reconcile, and then you choose your credit card account. Again, you're going to choose your reconciliation date, the ending balance on your credit card, and go through and check off all of the charges and all of the payments that have gone through. And again, your difference should be zero at the end. And again, you can print off those credit card accounts for your accountant. You want to double check your payroll liabilities. If you do have payroll, make sure those amounts look correct. And what I'll do is look at my amounts sitting in my payroll liabilities. And I can compare those two the amounts in QuickBooks. So if I look at my pay liabilities window and look at my 941, in my 941, I'm showing that I have 
$34.82.82 that I owe for December. If I look at my balance sheet, that is a combination of my federal and my FICA. So depending on how you've got your balance sheet and your payroll liabilities broken down, I'm going to say I've got 1364 plus 211882 equals the amount I'm showing that I owe for my federal 941. So just to double check for you, just to double check, see that you know your liabilities are equaling what your balance sheet is showing. Your sales tax payable, again, you're going to want to double check that that matches your sales tax report for the end of December. And if it doesn't, um, you're going to want to figure out why. Um, it's either making a journal entry possibly to bring that to what it should be, or maybe um, you haven't been paying your sales tax correctly. Maybe you're writing a check and coding it to a sales tax payable expense or a sales tax expense. And what you're going to want to do is, if you're using QuickBooks for your, in for your invoicing, you're going to want to make sure that your sales tax is computing properly and that it's going to the right account. So if your sales tax payable is a large dollar amount and maybe on your profit and loss statement, you have a sales tax expense, well, you're going to want to move those, those sales tax expense items to the sales tax payable. That's one thing I see quite often. For your liabilities, you can see I have a lot of loans out here. You're going to want to look at your loan statement from the bank, or if you don't have a loan statement, I would request one. And from that loan statement, you want to double check that your balance on your balance sheet matches the loan statement. Um, a lot of times you're just going to make your payments, code them to the loan, and most loans have interest involved in them. So sometimes when you're making your loan payments, you're not breaking down the interest and the principal payment. So what you can do if that's the case, maybe you forgot to record your interest all year, and this number should maybe be um, 10000 I can go right into my account register for that vehicle, for the liability, and as of the last day of the month, I'm going to say 501.47 is actually interest expense. And I'm going to type in my interest expense and I'm going to put 2022 interest. And that makes my loan $10,000. And that will change my balance sheet. So again, tie out the loans if you've got documentation from your bank. Send that along with your financial statements to your accountant because we love to see that. Um, let's see, and I did get a question. What if your bank account doesn't match the QuickBooks balance? Which one should you go by? Um, if your bank account does not match your QuickBooks balance, what you want to look for, go back to my banking and my previous reconciliation. If this reconciliation does not match your checking account balance at the end, you want to look for items that were cleared that maybe have a date in a future period. So if you've got an item that cleared and maybe this date was, I'm going to change this. So right now, my amounts don't balance, 
46.219, because I have a date that is in the future. But if it cleared the bank, like I'm showing here, it cleared my December bank statement, so I know this date is incorrect. So you can just go back in and change this date to whatever date it cleared the bank statement. And then your amounts should match. If for some reason they still don't match, um, one thing you wanna check is to see if you have any corrupt data in your system, or just maybe just look at the check register or um, do a quick report on your checkbook. So if I go into my chart of accounts, I look at my checking account, I can run a quick report on my checking account. And I am going to do it for, and I'm gonna leave, let's see. I'm gonna do, leave that, in the two blank, uh, it's not what I wanted to do. And maybe I'm gonna put this one way out in the future, 3022. So make this two date way out in the future. And what's possible is something might have gotten the wrong date put in. I've seen that happen often also. And if that's the case, then you're just gonna move it back to where it should be. And if that still doesn't make your um, bank statement match, then what I would do is take a look to see if maybe you have some damaged data. And damaged data is not that big of an issue. It happens quite often um, by no fault of anybody's. But with any software, every now and then the debits and credits seem to break apart. You go into File on the top menu bar and Utilities, you want to verify your data. And you should be verifying your data anytime that you're backing up to see if there's any problems with your data. If there are problems with your data, QuickBooks is going to tell you so right here, and it's going to say you should rebuild now. So rebuilding, what that will do, and I can get there again by going into Utilities, Verify Data, but rebuilding your data, it's just going to make you do a backup, and then it'll go right into the rebuild after the backup. After your rebuild is done, always go in and run another verification. And if, the, if it's still coming up with errors that you need to rebuild your data, re, try rebuilding it a couple times. And if it still has issues, then give me a call because um, that means you have some bad data damage and there are ways to narrow down what it could be and fix it. Um, if you have payroll, that's another big issue at your end. I'm going to go back to my home page. Um, what you want to do with payroll is you want to take a look at a couple things. You want to double check. I know the letters have been going out lately from the IRS, but you want to double check your um, EFTPS, your federal withholding payments and to double check that they are either still going to be monthly or maybe you've changed to a semi week or semi weekly depositor for federal and if you look at publication 15 see if i can call it up here quickly publication 15 from the irs and hopefully you can still see my screen. If you go to publication 15, this gives you a lot of really good payroll information.
Um, and it also tells you how to figure out how often you're supposed to be paying your 941. And what you're going to be doing for that is I will run a report, just a payroll summary report. And I'm just going to change my date to what you're going to be looking at for the 2019 tax year. So you're going to want to look at the period from 7-1-2017 through 630 of 2018. I'm just going to put my columns in total. I'm going to get rid of my hours and my rate. So this is the time period we're going to be looking for for 2019. Click OK. Right now it's not going to have anything, so I'm going to do 21 through 22. And what I'm going to do is I am going to add up my federal withholding, Medicare, and Social Security for the employee withholdings, and then the Medicare company and the Social Security company. And as I'm adding those up, those five items equal 13,768.06. If that amount that you're adding up for five, those five items is over $50,000, that means you're a semi-weekly depositor and your deposit dates are going to change. And again, Publication 15 will tell you those dates, um, but it depends on what your payday is. So if your actual check date falls on a Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, then your 941 payment is going to be due the following Wednesday. If your paycheck date lands on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, your semi-weekly 941 payment will be due on Friday of that week. So just some things to keep in mind because I've seen um, recently where clients have been getting emails, or I'm sorry, not emails, letters from the IRS saying, well, we switched you to a semi-weekly depositor at the first of the year, and maybe they didn't get the letter, or the letter got lost somewhere on their desk. They've been paying monthly, and now the government's trying to give them all kinds of penalties and interest. So just be careful with those items. Um, you might also get a letter from the state of Wisconsin changing your withholding frequency. There is also a um, Social Security Number Verification Service. So what that is, is the Social Security Administration out on their website under www.socialsecurity.gov slash BSO. You can do a search for that. Business Services Online. And what that will allow you to do, you're going to want to set up an account and then you can verify your employee's Social Security numbers through that account. It normally takes about a month though to get the information back from the SSA in order to do this. So if you want to verify your employee social security numbers, you're going to want to get this signed up for as soon as possible. But that's a way to verify your employee social security numbers. Um, that's one big thing that the IRS looks for when you're filing your W-2s is that the name and social security number match exactly. My name is Debbie Debbie, Debbie Denny, sorry, um, but my legal name is Deborah Otto Denny with a hyphen. So when I file my tax return and my W-2s come to me, it's Deborah Otto Denny. And that's the way it needs to be when you're doing your W-2s not Debbie Denny, how you go through every day of life, or 
um, Cindy Smith. It might be Cynthia Smith. Your name on your W-2s need to match your name on your Social Security card. Um, another thing about payroll you're going to want to keep in mind is fringe benefits. And this is a big one that some people don't always think of, and you need to. Um, fringe benefits are anything you give your employee that is not on their paychecks. So if you give your employee a $25 gift, gift card for Shell gas station or for Kohl's department store, that is a taxable item to your employee and needs to be added back to your W-2. Anything that has a price associated with it. Gift cards are the big ones that we see. Um, maybe your firm is a big, or your company's big Packer fan, and you give all your employees a Packer jacket. That value of that Packer jacket needs to be added to their W-2s as a fringe benefit. The biggest one I see is um, gift cards. But there could be other items that you give your employees that have that information. So for fringe benefits, we're going to do a setup of a fringe benefit. So I'm going to go to my list and my payroll item list. And there's a couple different fringe benefits out there. Um, not only the gift cards, but also if you're an S corporation and your business pays for health insurance for the officers of the company, if they're more than a 2% owner, they need to have a fringe benefit add back for their health insurance. So I am going to set up a regular fringe benefit right now. I do the custom setup, but you could also do an easy setup. I'll do one of each. So I'll do a custom setup for a gift card. So the payroll item type is actually going to be a company contribution. Click next. I'm going to say gift card. Next. And I'm just going to have both accounts going into payroll expenses. No agency, no number. Click Next. It's going to say I've chosen the same account. I'm going to say that's fine with me. Tax tracking type. This is the important one. It's going to be fringe benefits. Your fringe benefits are taxable benefits, and it's going to show you how it affects your 940, 941s, and W-2s. I'm going to click Next until the end and finish. So that's a gift card. Then I'm going to do another one. I'm going to do an easy set up, easy setup for other additions. I'm pretty sure this is how you do it because I'm not used to doing the easy setup. <laughs> And this is the right way to do it, because here's my taxable fringe benefits. Next. There's the payee account number. I'm going to leave those blank. I don't need a regular payment schedule. And I'm going to finish. And again, what that does is it just kind of puts the taxable fringe benefit in the system. So if I'm not sure how that's going to be posting, I can always double click on it and see the different areas that it's going to go to, the different accounts. I'm going to change this account because that's not the account I wanted to go to. I want everything just to go to payroll expenses so it zeroes itself out. And again, it's going to automatically pick fringe benefits. There are other fringe benefits that are out there too. Again, I mentioned for the S Corp shareholders, I'm going to set up a new company contribution. It's called S Corp Health. I'm 
make my account the same. Click Next. Tax Tracking Type. QuickBooks does have a tra tax tracking type for S Corp paid medical premium. And what this will do is in your W-2, it's going to report that S Corp med for your officers in box 14. So this is going to be something that is used for medical insurance for 2% shareholders of an S Corp. And click next because the default should be correct. When you do these add backs for your customers or for your employees, then you're going to want to do this. If it's gift cards, you should do it monthly. If it's um, anything else other than S Corp Health, even S Corp Health, you can do monthly or by paycheck. It's totally up to you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a payroll so you can see how these um, affect the payroll. And I'm going to do an unscheduled payroll for a date range that's in my current. And I'm going to open my paycheck detail. So let's say I gave Elizabeth $100 worth of gift cards. In my other payroll items, I'm going to put in gift cards. Right now, my check amount is 971.78. My federal withholding is $98. Social Security, 73. Medicare, 17. Once I put in my gift card of $100, my taxes are going to increase. So my check amount of 971 is going to decrease. Gift card of $100. So you could see how that affected my taxes and my check amount. So what it does is it, it doesn't add to your regular pay, it just increases your taxes to cover the taxes on the gift card. If this were an S Corp Health officer, I can add my S Corp Health and say the S Corp Health for the year is $15,000. Maybe I didn't add it going through um, each month. And the company maybe pays 100% of the S Corp Health for Elizabeth Mason. Well, S Corp Health is only taxable for federal and state taxes. So my federal withholding goes way up. And you can see I've got a negative paycheck. Well, if that's the case, you might need to issue a bonus to cover those taxes on the S Corp Health. Or what you can do is, one way or another, the employee is going to end up paying tax on it. So right now, my federal withholding is $110. I can just change that back to $110. You want to be careful, though, and double check with those S Corp shareholders that that doesn't put them in a penalty situation. So those S Corp shareholders may need to contact their accountant to see how that's going to affect their payroll. Um, or you might need to enter a bonus. I have a bonus set up. Uh, not here. I've got a bonus set up up here. So let's say my S Corp Health, I wanted to calculate the taxes on. So I'm going to issue my shareholder, because oh, I overbowed those before. So I'm going to issue my shareholder a bonus. And you might need to play around with that bonus in order to cover the taxes on at S Corp Health. Next, I'm going to talk about 1099. And 1099s 
are things that I find a lot of um, clients don't really understand very much about. And what a 1099 is, it's kind of like a W-2 for a vendor. And if you pay a vendor over $600 during the year, what you need to do is if that vendor, actually if it, the vendor provides a service to you and you pay them over $600 a year, then you need to issue them a 1099. So the first thing you should do, any vendor that's doing a service for you, you want to make them fill out a form W-9. And here's the form W-9. The name that they need to fill out is exactly as shown on their income tax return. So if it's Jim Smith doing business as Smith Construction, depending on what type of tax return they file, depends on what name shows up here. So if it's Jim, if it's just a single member LLC or sole proprietor, the name here should be Jim Smith doing business as Jim Smith Construction. Check the box for individual, and then they should be filling in their social security number if it's an individual sole proprietor. If it's a C Corp or an S Corp, the name goes in as the business name or partnership. And then they're going to want to fill out their employer ID number. So anybody that does a service for you, I would request this immediately. Um, I've actually had clients withhold payment from the vendor until they fill this up form out. So make sure you get this from your vendors. Um, the IRS has been cracking down on fines for not filing a 1099. So the fines have been going up and it's just a matter of time before they start getting very picky. But a 1099 miscellaneous form are the forms that QuickBooks prepares. QuickBooks does not do 1099 interest. It does not do 1099 dividends, but it will do your 1099 miscellaneous forms. Um, and we'll walk through looking at those in QuickBooks right now. So under the vendor menu, print e-file 1099s, and it's going to walk you through a 1099 wizard. So I'm going to get started. And here it's going to give me the 1099 vendors that I have selected so far. Well, if I know that there's a vendor in here that didn't, that should be in here, that isn't set up, sometimes I'll look through my profit and loss. And a lot of times I will look under my subcontractors. And under my subcontractors, because I've got jobs costing in this company file, I'm going to look at the source name. Because you can see the source name is different than the job name. The source name is who I paid. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort by name. So I can see CU Electric. I can obviously see I paid them more than $600 in the year. So I want to make sure that they're showing up in my listing of 1099 vendors. Here's Galleon Masonry. Well, I don't see them in here. And I paid them $1,000, so they should be set up for 1099. So I'm going to go back into my vendor center, look at Galleon Masonry. Under my tax settings, Here's where you're going to put in their vendor ID number or their tax ID number and check the box that they're eligible for a 1099. So I'm going to leave this blank because right now I don't have a 1099 ID number. And I'm going to say I don't want to enter the ID number now. Maybe I'll call them and get the ID number. Um, what I've also seen happen is the source name. If they're showing up in your list here, but not showing up in your vendor center, what happens probably is that 
you've made that name an other name. And then they're not going to show up in the vendor center, nor are they going to show up to issue them a 1099. So maybe Tom Ferguson here is a 1099 vendor, and I set him up as an other name. So what I can do, if he's on the other name list, I can just double click on him, change the type, and change him to a vendor. Click OK and OK, and now he's going to show up on the vendor list. And he'll be, then you can check him off for a 1099. So I'll go back to the wizard. Here's Galleon Masonry now. I'm going to continue. And right here, it's going to tell me to verify my 1099 information. And it does give me an area here to put in my state ID number. This is a new field because the state of Wisconsin now requires you to have that field in. So I'm going to put WI. If you don't have a ID number, um, you're going to want to enter. Oh, no, I forgot. I think it is, is, oh, can't remember. It is, oh, here on the website. And let's see. And I don't think that's the one. Sorry, I didn't have that handy. <laughs> there is a there's a publication out there. And I'm not finding it. It's got a lot of apes in it though. <laughs> The number that you need um, and if you need that number I can get it to you just um, maybe type it in the questions and I can get you that payer number and it's going to list for you all of the verify your 1099 all of the information so far that we have set up for 1099 I'm going to continue and here it's going to ask me to map my vendor payment Right now, it's only showing me 1099 accounts. I want to show all accounts because this will give me a list of all of the information or all of the expense. All of my chart of accounts is going to be in here. So I'm going to look down my chart of accounts, and maybe in my cost of goods sold, I might have some non employee compensation. So I'm going to choose that. Maybe in my job expenses, I might have non-employee compensation. Equipment rental, that might be under my rent. So things like that, you're going to want to choose for your 1099 information on where to map things. Repairs and maintenance, that's non-employee compensation. So anybody that's doing any type of service for you, you know, your repairman, for instance. Um, the guy cutting your grass. Professional fees. Professional fees are always non-employee compensation. You're legal, you're accounting. Your rent expense is should be getting a 1099 in the rent box. Again, repairs, non-employee compensation. Any type of repairs, that's a service. They're doing something for you. So you're going to want to make sure those are mapped out. If you maybe put on an addition to your building, those construction workers or those masons or painters or, um, you know, the builders, the plumbing people, they should get a 1099. So under buildings and improvement, you're going to want to map that to non-employee compensation. 
continue. I can view my included payments or excluded payments, but I'm going to continue. And what it's going to do is it's going to give me all of my 1099 vendors right here. Well, I'm, I can also look at a summary report or a detail report. And I'll show you that right now. So under vendors, print e-file 1099s, here's where I can find my summary report. And I can also find it here. So I'm gonna look at my summary report. And I'm gonna say this calendar year, because it's a good thing to do this right now for this calendar year, so you can get any W-9 forms. I'm gonna change my 1099 options to all vendors, and then to all accounts. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to look at my vendor and then look at my totals to see if any of these vendors might be eligible or should get a 1099. So Custom Kitchens of Bayshore, if they did labor when they installed the kitchen, they should get a 1099. So what I'm going to do is I can change them here. Just, I can actually just double click on them here. I think. Uh, it's not going to work. I'm going to want to go into my vendor list and go to my vendor center and find custom kitchens of Bayshore and check them off that they should possibly get a 1099. And maybe, okay, so it's still showing it's uncategorized. It's not showing it's non employee compensation. So I'm going to look and see. Uh, it looks like all I did was buy inventory from them. So they didn't give me any labor costs. If the inventory items also included labor, say I bought inventory and, la and I paid for labor, you can either break it down. Um, so you put your inventory on one line and your labor in the other. Let's say for this invoice, I bought some cabinet poles and light pine cabinet wall units, but I also had subcontracting labor. They charged me $7,000 to put in those cabinets. I'm just going to recalculate my check then. And another thing is, is that these 1099s are based on the cash basis. So if I've got a bill out here for custom kitchens in the Bayshore, and I haven't paid that bill yet, QuickBooks is not going to do a 1099 for them. So I'm just going to quick pay this. So we can see it in our 1099 report. So you can always double click on the on the uncategorized and if you need to split it between 1099 and not 1099, you can do that. So Diane's Auto Shop, non-employee compensation, I need to get a W-9 from her, no tax ID on file and go through and look at your galleon masonry. I need my federal ID number for them. Kind of go through and look at that summary report. You can see I've rented some equipment from Hopkins, so I've got some rent expense. So this is the report I like to run this time of year. Again, it's under vendors. Print file 1099s, and it's a 1099 summary. And again, you can get to it on the screen also, just to verify that you have all your information. Click Continue. You can either print your 1099s on the actual form,
and it will tell you the number of vendors that get a 1099, the total amount, and it'll tell you if you've got a valid ID and a valid address. You need both of them in order to do the 1099. You can print your 1099s, and QuickBooks will also print your 1096 for you if you're doing these through QuickBooks. Well, right now I've got 12 vendors that should be getting 1099s, and for Wisconsin, that means I have to file those electronically. So, in QuickBooks, you can file electronically by going to the 1099 e-file service. And what this does is it goes out to a partner, Tax 1099, that QuickBooks has partnered with, and it will take your data from QuickBooks and it will do your 1099. Um, see, right now it's not, oh, here we go. But QuickBooks will charge you $2.90 a form. So if I have 12 forms, it's gonna cost me $32.80 $32 to have them electronically filed. And QuickBooks does also do the state. Okay, so with Wisconsin, if you've got 10 or more, 1099s, you can do them through QuickBooks, but it's gonna cost you. Okay, so I've got some questions coming in. And let's see if I can answer those. Um, let's see. Information for 1099s and what the qualifications are. Um, I just kind of mentioned what those are. And um, there is an IRS publication out there for the 1099s that give you, gives you the type of non-employee compensation. Um, professional fees. Fees, fees paid for one professional to another, payments for attorneys or witnesses, um, payments for services for repairs, um, let's see, commissions paid to non-employee salespeople. Um, let's see. Director's fees, if you do have directors that you pay fees to. So things like that. Um, mainly it's for services, though. Let's see. If the vendor is a corporation, a C corporation, they normally will not get a 1099. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Although there is a caveat to that. If they are a C corporation and they have attorney fees, they should still be issuing a 1099 for those attorney fees. Okay, let's find another question. Um, let's see. QuickBooks that had a credit from a vendor from a previous period that was an error. What is the proper way to clean it up so the new year is clean? So what would have happened, if there is a vendor credit out there, and do a vendor credit, and we'll do this in 21. So let's say this is a vendor credit for a prior year. So what happens is in that prior year, in 2021, their utilities, they actually paid $100, paid tax on $100 too little. So their income should have been $100 higher for last year. 
So what you should do is this year enter a bill for that vendor. I can't remember which one I picked. For the $100 to even that out and put a memo in. Credit for prior or bills adjust for prior adjust for prior year error. So then this year you're fixing the credit out there, and then you're also when you're um, paying your bills, you can offset that bill right here with the credit that is out there and make it go away. Okay, so that'll clear it off your accounts payable also. Okay, if the vendor is a corporation, do you still have to do a 1099? Um, only for legal fees. Let's see. There is an issue with if you've misclassified a vendor. Um, if you're looking through your vendor list and realize, well, maybe a vendor should have been an employee because the IRS has been kind of cracking down on that also. Um, there is a voluntary classification settlement program. And what you can do is get a hold of the IRS. And, and if you actually Google um, form 8952, it will give you the information on what to do. But what it'll do is it'll let you take that vendor and move them to employee status and pay a smaller amount that it would have cost you if the IRS found that error. So maybe I've been subcontracting somebody and then they're the only, I'm the only customer that that vendor has and they work strictly for me and I give them the jobs, I give them the work, I tell them how to do the work, I supply them with the tools. That's an employee, that's not a subcontractor. So if I've been using that subcontractor for a long time, I'm going to want to make them an employee. So again, it's form 8952 and your um, it will give you a smaller penalty and then the IRS will not come back at you for making that error. Um, let's see, if you maybe started using QuickBooks in the middle of the year, there is a way to get, to trick QuickBooks into preparing a 1099. So, to trick QuickBooks, you're going to want to do a journal entry. So let's say I started my company file partway through the year, and I know from my prior software that I paid um, my vendor my CPA I've got a thousand dollars worth of fees that I paid her from my prior accounting software that I don't have in QuickBooks so what I'm going to do is you need to start with the checking account on the first line, and I'm going to say 1099 fix as the as the memo. Then I'm going to say accounting fees. I paid her a thousand dollars, and that's going to be my vendor. For my accountant and then I'm going to choose my accounting fees 
without the name. And then it should add that to my 1099 list. I'm just going to save that and double check. Numbers. It, this will always default to last calendar year. I'm going to change that to this calendar year. And that is A. And I'm still not seeing her. So what I did wrong is I need to put the credit in first with no name, and then the debit with the name. Now if I save that, there she is. Where is she? Uh, you know what? I don't think I saved. Oh, you know what? She's probably not marked for a 1099. Let's see. My vendor center. Nope, she wasn't marked for a 1099. That's why she wasn't showing up. And there she is now under non employee compensation. So I always do for 1099 all vendors, all accounts. You can use it thresholds, which is the $600. Then once I know I have everything looking like it should look, then I'll change it to only 1099 vendors, only 1099 accounts, after I've reviewed everything and everything looks proper. And then this is the amount that I'll have for my 1099s at the end of the year. With QuickBooks, one other Thing to mention, there is the cash versus accrual method of accounting. And most people keep their books on an accrual basis. That way you're tracking your accounts payable and accounts receivable. And in QuickBooks, you can toggle between cash basis and accrual basis. Um, if this is a version 2019. So if I customize the report, so you've got an older version and change it to cash. You can toggle between the two in cash and accrual basis. So on an accrual basis, I've got $13,070 as income. If I changed my profit and loss to a cash basis, I have a credit of 31723 And my cash basis um, balance sheet changes also because my accounts payable and accounts receivable, you can see how they change. Um, they don't zero out exactly because some might be partial payments in there or credits that are in there. But, um, and for finance, for tax reporting, you can't just change one way to another. So, um, you can just toggle between them. Normally, it's kind of close if you're keeping your books on accrual and then you have to pay your taxes on a cash basis. Um, let's see. Made a payment for a nonprofit to someone for rent assistance. Um, does that get included on a... 1099. I'm not quite sure about that, Bobby, but I will get back to you. I'll take your name. And what I'm going to do now is I will open it up. I will unmute you all. And if you have any questions, we've got a few minutes left, so we can go through some questions. Okay, and I'm thinking you could, now you should be able to unmute yourself. 
and read all, yes. And ask any questions that you might have. Or if you want, you can still um, type them in. Um, I did get a question. How do you set up um, personal use of vehicles? If you have if you have a company vehicle and your employees use it for personal use, again, you're going to want to set up a payroll item, a new payroll item. I'm going to do a custom company contribution. It's called PUA or personal use of auto. Um, you're going to calculate it based on the type of calculation you're using. There are several different um, calculations you can use for personal use of auto. I'm going to use the same account. Again, my tax tracking type is going to be fringe benefits. Very similar to the credit card setup. When you're doing, I shouldn't say credit card, the gift card setup. So that is how you would do personal use of auto. Um, when you're setting up items in QuickBooks, when you look at your payroll item list, I'm just going to look at the custom setup. If I've got additions or deductions, um, let's see. I'm going to just look at additions and just do that. Oh, I want to do subtraction, I think. What QuickBooks has is the tax tracking type is the important thing. And with, depending on what tax tracking type you're using, QuickBooks knows what code to put in on the W-2. So if I'm using a 401k, QuickBooks knows that it's going to be an employee deduction and it's going to have the retirement box checked and it's going to put that amount in box 12 with a code of D. So this tax tracking type is very important when you are setting up any payroll type items. Simple IRAs, uh, premium if you've got a Section 125 only plan for your health insurance, you're going to want to make sure that health insurance deduction is set to the premium only. For tips, taxable group term life, if you have if you offer over $50,000 worth of group term life insurance for your employees, that is a taxable item. Um, publication 15B, as in boy, from the IRS will tell you about what amount you need to do the add back for. So you want to make sure you get your tax tracking type correct when you are doing your setup. Um, Let's see, I got a uh, question. Use QuickBooks for property rentals on a cash basis. We know we will never collect old rent due. What's the best way to write the account off in QuickBooks? Since you're on a cash basis, it doesn't really count as a bad debt and isn't a tax write-off. Um, what you would do in that case is you would do a credit for that customer. Let's see here. You create a credit memo, which would go directly to your rent. When you invoice them initially, you invoice them to the rent income. So when you do the credit, you're going to be decreasing your rent income. Um, you're just going to want to make sure, depending on how you give your books to your accountant, that you are giving them the same type of report, that you're not switching it to a cash versus accrual basis. But when you invoice that renter, you're going to want to use the same item that you invoice them for in the credit memo. 
Then when you do the credit memo, it's going to ask you if you want to apply it to an invoice, and you can do that. Um, what I'm going to do now is if you do have any, any questions that come up in the future, in the description here, I'm going to give you my contact information. So it's Debbie Denny, and my email address is gdenny at hawkins-tpas.com. So you, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, um, and I will try to get back to you as soon as I possibly can. So I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and got some helpful information out of it. And I truly appreciate all of you coming and sitting in on the webinar today. We will let you know in the future when we plan the next um, webinar. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and happy holidays. Thank you.